Doris Ann earned her academic degrees at Col Columbia University. Her career as a reference librarian and library manager included working at Columbia, Boston, and Harvard universities. A 45-year resident of Auburndale, she's a co-manager of Auburndale's Harwood Fund, and she was a founding member of Engine 6. Randy Block has lived in Newton since 1990. He was active in the William Street PTO and taught religious education at his Unitarian Universalist Church. He chaired the Neighborhood Riverside Committee in 2018 and helped negotiate the compromise plan that the City Council adopted unanimously. Well, as both of you have been informed, the idea of this debate is to fairly apportion time, but to have this be as conversational as possible. And as moderator, I'll be actively engaged in moving the process along. And I'll go back and forth between the two of you as to which one of you will get to answer each question first. So we'll start with Doris. And what are your top three priorities and why? Well, housing is a top priority for me because housing is pretty basic to human life. And we need to make sure that we have housing that works for everybody in Newton. Um, and uh, as climate action, of course, is extremely important because we're facing a lot of challenges with flooding and um, we really need to pay attention to how we're going to mitigate climate changes that are happening around us. Um, and uh, thirdly, um, I am uh, uh, concerned about making sure that our schools are well supported, that our teachers are well supported. Thanks. Thanks. You'll get used to it, Darcy. Uh, Randall, your top three priorities, please. Thanks for that question, Marjorie. My top three priorities are based on what I'm hearing when I've knocked on almost every door in this ward. Development, schools, and constituent service. Development is a concern because it's the major issue being considered by the City Council right now. And the proposal before the city council goes far beyond what the state is requiring for this 8,330 units, which I'm sure we'll talk about some more later. Schools, parents are very concerned about the learning loss that their children have experienced due to COVID. They're concerned about the current teacher negotiations and the uncertainty regarding that. So I definitely uh, support um, collective bargaining and we'll get back to constituent service another time. And as a matter of fact, you're not going to have to wait long because certainly the, as far as the zoning issue is concerned, because that may be the most compelling issue facing voters during this election season. So there's a general understanding uh, that there are two plans going forward. One, the state mandated uh, goal of 8,330 new residential units by right. And then the uh, city council's village overlay district to reinvigorate uh, our city centers. And um, I, I sh I'm sure that you know that over a period of the changing in the plans and uh, uh, the various iterations that the numbers have been as high as 15,000 and as low as 7,300 to 9,300. And with all of this confusion, um, Randall, you uh, you go first with this. Um, you said that you you feel that it's too much. Can you elaborate on it? And um, what what are you comfortable going forward with? It's very interesting that you talk about confusion of numbers. I, I agree with you. There's confusion over numbers. Why is that? Whose responsibility is it? to collect numbers on something this important and present it to us. I think the city council has a responsibility to ask those questions. I think the planning department and the mayor have a responsibility to answer those questions. And as far as I know, they haven't. So I, I think it's very unfortunate that there is confusion uh, around all this. The state has made it very clear that where the 83 
130 units come from. It's a 25% increase in our current housing stock, um, but obviously the plan before the city council goes far beyond that. Uh, Doris, Ann, are you comfortable with the plan before the city council, or the the, the two plans going uh, that are before the city council? I I am comfortable. I actually uh, am a housing advocate and have been for the last ten years or so. And um, housing is very basic human right. Uh, we need more housing, and uh, housing is. Um, something that will help our businesses, our businesses, our downtown business, small businesses. Here in Armadale, we have examples of businesses who need a lot more customers in order for them to thrive. Um, our schools are losing uh, population. We need more families. We need more kids. Um, so yes, I think we need more housing. We need well, various kinds of housing that will you know, that that will serve people at various income levels. Well, that you lead right into another question because a major concern is a lack of affordable housing. And how do you feel that um, the the current plans address the needs specifically for affordable housing? And what's your definition of affordable? Uh, Let's see, Dar uh, Doris Ann, I think you're starting on this one. Well, there are lots of different uh, definitions of affordable, and um, often you will hear a certain percentage of the area median income as 80% as being kind of average. But then um, there are many people who live below, at incomes below that average, and so we need, that's why I'm saying that we need in, we need housing at various price points and, um, and, and various sizes. Uh, we need different sizes and types of housing. We need more multifamily housing and um, that will, will help with our school enrollment and it will help with um, the environment and um okay thank you for uh adhering to the clock i really appreciate that randall what's your sense of the city's need for affordable housing how many units um would seem to be in, uh necessary and do you think that the plans now provide for an adequate number of affordable units this issue of affordable housing comes up a lot from people who live in Ward 4. It's a high priority for them. It's a high priority for me. It's important to keep in mind, though, that this state legislation that we're talking about says nothing about affordability. There's no affordability requirements. There's no more money from the state in order to subsidize housing. I think that's very unfortunate. Um, one thing I want to say about affordable housing as a general topic, I think of it as housing for low-income families. This is, this is the moral imperative that we face as a society and as a city. I point to the armory development as being a great example of preserving buildings and creating more housing that will be occupied by low-income families. And I think we need to do more of those state-city partnerships. Uh, Doris, to what extent has the housing that it's already been built, uh, say, for example, um, in Austin Street and, and those buildings along there, to what extent have, and there have been some very big, uh, there's a big apartment unit in Wabin. Do you think that affordable units are coming along with those developments? By law, they need to, uh, if they're over a certain number of units, by law, they need to have a certain percentage of units offered at affordable levels that are specified by the city. So yes, they will have the larger the larger developments will have affordable 
uh, affordable units because they're required to. Randall, you uh, something that I read indicated you've spoken favorably about the conversion of Newton Armory for affordable housing uh, and um, the need to identify other state-owned properties for such opportunities. Do you have any specific uh, state-owned properties in mind, or is this some kind of theoretical? Let me let me say this about our housing policy in Newton, such as it is. We have gotten into a trap of linking our affordable housing expansion with for-profit development. Yes, we have an inclusionary zoning ordinance, and that's terrific. Developers can buy out of it. They can just pay into a fund instead of creating the housing. Um, and also this 85-15 split, we're never going to be, become more diverse community if that's what we're stuck with. That's why the 100% housing approach for sizes like the Armory is a, a really good thing to try and develop more and more of. And um, I, I, I'd love to sit down with the state and go over all the properties that they control in Newton. It's, it, it would be a very interesting process. Doris, do you have any other ideas on uh, conversion of state-owned property? We're very lucky to have gotten the armory for a dollar. I'm not sure how many other state properties we would get for a dollar. I have been inside that armory, and it's like a shooting gallery. So there is a lot of um, toxic stuff in there. It's not a place that's suitable for families until it's really been cleaned up. So it's a pretty expensive process to get that property in a state where it can be used by families, um, which, which I think that's gonna happen and I think it will be great, but it's not an easy thing. Um, I'd like to hear from you your sense of traffic impacts when you build large housing properties. Uh, Randall, Randy, excuse me. Well, traffic is one of those issues that comes up over and over again when I talk to people in Ward 4. If you try to get through Auburndale Square at certain times of the day, it's going to take you quite a while. Um, so I think we have to weigh that when we think about what kind of additional housing, what kind of additional construction we're going to allow in this city, making something that's barely tolerable now um, more, more congested, I'm not sure that that's a very smart way to um, plan going forward. So we need to do a much better job managing traffic and we need to do a careful job planning for how traffic is going to be affected by any changes that we make. Ours, do you have any thoughts on traffic impacts, either directly yes. from the building or just in general? In, in our well, well, we, we definitely uh, have a lot of traffic, can have a lot of traffic, but one of the ways that uh, traffic can be managed is with the multifamily housing. When you have multifamily housing that's near the village centers, then people don't have to use their car necessarily to go to the drugstore or the grocery store or other other places where they would want to go. Um, so I think that village center principle of having housing in village centers really supports the visit the it re, report it supports the businesses in the village centers but it also cuts down on traffic when people live close enough to actually be able to walk. Uh, I could, I, could I, could I comment quick. on that? Uh, um, we're talking about increasing the population of Newton. 15%, 20%, 25%, who knows, but it's going to add to what we have now. Adding more people in the village centers who can walk to stores, that's a wonderful idea but it's not going to reduce the amount of traffic that the current population produces. Doris, do you want to rebut that or should I? Well, there might be some people who would like to live in those village centers if they had the opportunity, if there was housing there that they could move to, especially a lot of people I know who are downsizing 
uh, have trouble finding places to live and in living in a walkable village center would be ideal for them if they could find it, if we could uh, produce it. I'd, I'd like to ask each of you what you think are the best prospects in your ward for of specific areas for more affordable housing. Um, Doris? Oh gosh, I have not been going around looking at potential sites, but I'm sure there are many. I would um, love to take that on as an assignment. But I think, um, you know, we have some stores that are not very tall. Uh, we have, um, I, I uh, think that there are parking lots around that maybe there could be some uh, uh, buildings there instead of parking lots that are mostly empty mm -hmm. right in Irondale Square. Um, yeah, I think that 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 there is it wouldn't be too hard to find those places. Randy, your thoughts? Um, I live in Newton Lower Falls, which has 499 housing units, 83 of which are subsidized and qualify for the state affordable housing inventory. That's 17 percent of Newton Lower Falls. That's the kind of neighborhood we are. We like it that way. And I think that other neighborhoods need to um, develop similar strategies for trying to reach that level of housing affordability. I, I think it's great. Uh, speaking of village centers, there's broad support for uh, rebuilding our village centers optimally for small businesses, local businesses. Um, how would you do that? And given the costs of construction, therefore rentals, how would you keep out chain stores from taking over the village centers uh, when new development comes in? Randall? Randy, sir. That's okay. I think that's a great question, the way you framed it. I've talked to small business owners and they're not very excited about this village center overlay plan for the exact reason that, that you're asking that question. New construction is expensive. If new construction is built, their rents go up. And that's the real key to supporting small businesses. Yes, they'd love more foot traffic, of course, who wouldn't? But the key to their continued existence is rental income. Just ask Newtonville Camera. They used to be in Newtonville, and where do you think they are now? They're in Waltham because they couldn't afford the new rents. And when you tear down a building, you've got to relocate, and you're not going to come back. Doris Ann? Well, I wasn't talking about tearing down any buildings. Uh, but we can renovate buildings. We actually do have in Auburndale some spaces where buildings should be built, um, where there are holes right now. Um, and our, you know, we we are a walkable village. People do walk downtown. And I think that's important for our local businesses. Um, my daughter started one of those local businesses, Bread Song Bakery. And um, they would love to have more people walking by. So would Just Next Door, which is another small business in Auburndale Center. They would love to have more people coming by and stopping in. What remaining green spaces are there in Ward 4? And what would you do to preserve them? Start with Doris Ann this time. Move on to Randy. Well, we have a, a fabulous lion's field and we have trails, walking trails in the forest near lion's field. Um, I've spent a lot of time there when I had my own dog and now I spend time there with my grand dog. Um, and they're, they're wonderful trails um, and it's, it's very woodsy. It's just fabulous. Randy? Well, I think the big opportunity are these trails um, along the Charles River. Some exist and some need to be improved. This is state-owned property. The state should really 
finance the uh, renovation and access for bicycles and pedestrians. Um, Ward 4 is very fortunate to have an awful lot of green space in the cove, um, all along the Charles River. Um, it's a very attractive place to live. Uh, digging down into the issue of of green, how would you beef up our local ordinance to protect the existing tree canopy? Um, you know, there's a lot of regulatory apparatus around it, but I wonder what your thoughts are on that, Randy. The, the, the city's tree ordinance is currently being considered in committee. I am a strong supporter of strengthening that ordinance. Um, Newton has a reputation for having a weak uh, tree protection policy. I've seen firsthand what happens. I won't mention names, but in my particular street, somebody just cut down all their trees. They said they were going to add an addition to their house, and then they never did. And the tree, uh, ar the city arborist came by, and there was absolutely nothing he could do. Um, there needs to be um, higher cost uh, through our permit system of taking down trees. If they're diseased, if they're damaged, that's one thing. But just saying, I want to take down trees, these are a community asset and we need to protect them. Dara Sam? I love trees. <laughs> we need trees. Um, and yes, I will, in my walk, sometimes cr uh, come across a tree that's not healthy at all, that's ready to ready to be cut down because it's it's rotting and i will report that to the the city forestry department um and i uh just reported something to them the other day it was a tree that was being overcome by vines um it was just totally covered in vines so yeah we need to take care of our trees uh how do you i grew up in northern new hampshire which is tree country <laughs> Also, snow country. Yes, true. Uh, how do you uh, feel about the transportation options currently available in the city? Newton's leaders propose encouraging residents to use public transport, uh, transport bikes, um, or, or walk, and uh, by reducing parking requirements and redesigning streets for pedestrians and cyclists. Would you support these measures, or would you? pursue a different approach if elected. Randy? Well, of course, the city is taking a, a, a very proactive role in encouraging people to walk and bicycle. And there are safety issues that need to be dealt with. And I, I think we're going to have to work those through. I think the use of public transit is another story. We see headlines all the time about safety issues on the MBTA system. The federal government has come down very hard on on the the system and to think that people are going to um, locate and use the 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 current mbta green line system that goes through newton in a significant way i think that's just fantasy i i wish that weren't the case this has been an underfunded system for years and i don't see that changing anytime soon Garcian? I have quite a different view of it. In fact, part of the reason that we moved here to Avondale be, is because there was an abundance of public transit. My husband was blind, and in order for him to um, travel independently to get to work, um, he needed public transit. So we have an express bus that goes right by our house. We have the commuter rail that's walkable distance away. We have the green line that's walkable distance away from our house. So I'm, I'm very much a, a fan of public transit. And I have to say that my um, kids and grandkids before they were old enough to drive also use that public transit a lot and still do sometimes. So Newton has some of the uh, worst pothole streets in the metropolitan area. And that's bad for cars and pedestrians and cyclists and so forth. What would you specifically do to amp up that that program for safe safe streets? Uh, Doris Ann, you want to go first? Well, we we certainly need to get rid of the potholes. We need to address the potholes. And uh, yes, there are some out there, and it happens every spring. 
um, that needs to be perhaps more money needs to be put into that department that fixes the roads and sidewalks. Um, yeah, it's not just the roads, it is the sidewalks too. Sidewalks have gouges in them that can be dangerous for anybody who's walking along and not looking down as I was one day. Um, and so, yeah, those definitely need maintenance. Randy, Randy, is this just a question of money or is it management as well? I think that you've touched on uh, an issue of constituent service that is that comes up a lot. People complain about the sidewalks. They complain about potholes. The city does have a system for evaluating all these things. And I have a feeling I'm going to get to know them very well if I'm elected. Being a linkage between the constituents who have issues and the city departments that are supposed to respond to these issues, that's a very important role for the city council to play. Um, so that's, I mean, the, the potholes have to be filled and um, maybe there is a, a funding issue. Well, that's, that's one of the things we'll just have to explore. Well, speaking of money, the city has about 40 million in surplus funds. We don't have to go into the source of that. And the, but the mayor proposed putting a large portion into new operations booster stabilization fund. Just this past week, the city council voted her down on her proposal. Um, what's the dispute here? And if you had control over that money, what would you propose to do? Um, and I think it's Randy who was first this time. As I understand some of the concerns, it is whether the school system is being adequately funded right now. And I do think there are questions about whether teacher aid positions have been fully restored, whether there are special programs to help kids who've suffered learning loss because of COVID. Um, that's something we really need to properly fund now. I think that's very much on the city council's mind. It would be on my mind too. I give the mayor credit. She's attempting to um, deal with school funding issues as well as the deficit in our retirement fund. So I appreciate the effort that she's made and I look forward to the city council working with the mayor to come up with a more flexible plan that they can all agree on. Doris Ann, do you have a sense of what your priorities would be in uh, dealing with those monies? Well, I definitely am a fan of fully uh, fully funding the schools. And I, I know that there are some um, staff now who feel that they're not being fully supported. And that, that to me is uh, one of our highest priorities. I think uh, the schools having excellent teachers and uh, having excellent facilities, those are some of the values that Newton residents are, I think are very important. I've, ha I've had that mentioned to me a number of times as I've been knocking on doors. Well, digging down even more deeply into finances, one question that never goes away has to do with uh, our so-called OPEB liability, the funding for post-retirement health benefits. Uh, are you satisfied that we're on the right track in terms of how much we're providing? And what are a couple of additional things that you would do to put the city on a firmer financial footing? Randy? Interesting question. A long-term challenge for this city is its finances. We don't get a very large percentage from commercial property. It's about 15%. And the residential inhabitants of Newton have a way of demanding a lot of services from schools to roads. We need to do a better job on economic development to try and figure out what's the best way forward for Newton financially. Sometimes people talk about uh, payment in lieu of taxes. It's, it's interesting, it's state law which allows non large nonprofits like hospitals and universities to be exempt from property tax. And perhaps that law ought to be re-examined. We have a very strong legislative delegation. 
maybe it's time to put them to work for Newton. I'd like to move on to Doris Ann on that, but aren't the pilot tax uh, pilot payments negotiated between the city and the nonprofit? They are under current law, but but that's only because the current law exempts them from paying taxes. Doris Ann, what is your sense of of things that would put the city on a more solid financial footing? We. I mean, we can always raise taxes, I suppose. I mean, that's always something that you don't want to do, but maybe sometimes you have to do it. Um, and I am in favor of paying my fair share. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I think that there could be a variety of, of uh, choices made by the mayor who makes these economic decisions really um and i'm i'm looking forward to hearing more about this from her and uh what the city council is going to do about it if anything so i uh, wanted to ask you about what you think that the city of Newton can do to amp up national grids efforts to address the gas leaks throughout the city. I mean, nobody wants to see a tragedy such as that that occurred in North Andover with a national with with a uh, gas company explosion four years ago. So, uh, what can what can the city do, and what can you do as a city councilor, um, Darasan? Well, I'm not exactly sure. I know that Mothers Out Front has been working on this issue for quite some time now, um, going around and spotting all of those gas leaks that are sitting there and spewing out. Um, it's really a problem we have to address. Um, and, you know, maybe the city council and the mayor need to come down a little more heavily on the utilities companies that are responsible. Randy? Well, uh, Doris Ann and I can agree that it is the utility companies that are responsible for repairing this. Perhaps the um, toll-free number that is available to citizens to report gas leaks should be publicized better. It's very important that we all understand uh, the dangers of gas leaks and that we um, respond when they come to our attention. I mean, it clearly uh, raises the issue of our ongoing dependence on fossil fuel. The, the uh, city is uh, interested in regulating future hookups to gas. How do you how do you feel about that? And it, either one of you can jump in on that. Well, well I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm, I, I'm very, very much in favor of getting away from fossil fuels. And I've been doing that rather systematically over the last few years in my own home. Um, so um, I have pretty much electrified the whole place and have solar panels. Um, and if there were more incentives, there might be more people who would do the same. And I think that that could help us if that became a campaign of the city government. Randy, how do you feel about that? I, I think Newton's doing a pretty good job about publicizing and incentivizing shifting away from fossil fuels, requiring it for new, for new construction and enabling people where it's feasible to put up solar panels. One of the things I wanna mention is that the effects of climate change are gonna be felt here, whatever we do. Um, there was a uh, flood in August that totaled all the cars that were parked in the um, city's library parking lot. Um, that's a warning sign. That's gonna happen again, and our stormwater drainage system needs to be evaluated, and we need to up our game. That's um, otherwise, our basements and our neighborhoods are all gonna be in jeopardy of flooding. Are there any other specific steps that either one of you would recommend? I'm, or we can we can move on. Uh, how do you plan to involve residents in the decision-making process 
in Newton. And we're looking for some very specific ideas. Randy? Listening to people is in my DNA. I've done it all my life. And knocking on all these doors, it's really an education. Certainly, there are things like holding office hours and writing newsletters. I, I'm a strong believer in neighborhood organizations. I'm on the board of the Lower Falls Improvement Association. Um, we listen to neighbors all the time and try and get them involved in various civic issues. I, I think that all neighborhoods really need that kind of organizing and I would support that as a city councilor. Doris Ann? Could you specific? repeat the question, please? Sure. How do you plan to involve residents in the decision-making process in Newton in, in very specific ways? As I've been going around knocking on doors, I've had a lot of conversations and a lot of opportunities to actually address some of the issues that people have. Um, I'm not a counselor yet, but there are things that I can just do as a citizen. And I have done things like, um, you know, vines that are overtaking, overtaking the trees in a city parking lot. Uh, the forestry department is going out and help that get rid of those vines. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, as a reference librarian, what I did for the bulk of my career was to every day talk with people, try to help them solve their problems. And that's that's exactly what I would do as a city councilor as well. Uh, there was a time when the when City Hall used to send out a questionnaire once a year to all households to assess the level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction with various uh, city services and other aspects of living in Newton. Would you push to have that reactivated, Randy? It's it's really important to listen to what our constituents say. And I'm afraid that I have to tell you, they don't feel they're being heard. There was a Washington Street survey. They didn't want buildings more than three stories tall. What are we looking at now? Five stories, maybe what's called five and a half stories, which is really six stories. Um, so yes, there ought to be a reactivation of surveys like that but we really need to commit ourselves to listening and, re and responding positively to what our constituents are telling us. Doris, anything that you want to add to that about or the po react to the possibility of resurrecting that questionnaire? Uh, well, it, it never hurts to get input. I mean, people's input that they can give through a questionnaire when they have time to sit down and think about it as they're filling out that questionnaire. That's helpful. I would, I would, I would love to have that happen from time to time. Uh, we've promised each one of you a, a an opportunity to pose a question to your opponent. So uh, let's start with you, Darasan, and then we'll go to Randy. What question would you like to ask Randy? Um, Randy, my understanding is um, from a previous conversation we had is that you're very, um, you feel that green space is very important as do I. Um, so I'm um, wondering about your support of lack of, or lack of support for a, a trail that was proposed to be built through Lower Falls? It's a, it's a very localized issue in Newton Lower Falls. And I'm puzzled as to why you think I'm opposed to this bicycle trail. The only discussions I've had regarding it are how controversial it was in Lower Falls. I live a block away from where I think you're referring to. And this trail um, was opposed by just about everybody who abutted on that trail. I, I think we were all 
very surprised in Lower Falls about how controversial it was. And people, I think, regretted um, how controversial it became. So my, I never really took a position on it because I wasn't an immediate abutter. Randy, do you have a question for Doris Ann? Yes, I do. Doris Ann, you supported the proposed new city charter in 2017 that would have eliminated the ward councilor seats on the city council. And now you're seeking to fill the very seat that you voted to eliminate. How do you explain this? Well, I didn't change the system. So now I'm going with the system. Let me let me ask you this. Uh, can each one of you describe, you, you've talked about your priorities. Can you give us a sense of the community activities in which you have specifically been involved leading up to your decision to run that would um, be relevant to your priorities or your sense of community needs? Uh, Randy? In uh, 2018, I volunteered to serve on a neighborhood committee on Riverside. This committee negotiated a compromise with the developer that reduced the proposal from a million and a half square feet to a million square feet. We worked tirelessly on behalf of the residents of Auburndale and Lower Falls. During this time, I thought it was interesting that my opponent opposed the reduction in this, in this development because it meant a reduction in total number of housing. We fought to increase the percentage of space that was allocated to housing. We succeeded in increasing it from 50% to 62%. This is the kind of approach that I will take, and it's a clear difference in approach between me and my opponent. Doris Ann, uh, do you want to rebut that, and but then talk about the community activities in which you have uh, been intimately involved? Well, Engine Six um, is one of the one of the organizations that I've been a member of. In fact, was a founding member of, and Engine Six advocates for more housing, and particularly for more affordable housing. So, uh, we talk with developers. We try to get, you know, more three bedroom uh, three bedroom units that will support families, and um, so, so this has taken up a lot of my time over the last 10 years or so. Um, I also am um, a, uh, one of the managers of what's called the Harwood Fund. The Harwood Fund uh, is a fund that was uh, left as a bequest to my church, the United Parish of Auburndale, uh, many years ago. And uh, the purpose of the fund was to assist Arbordale residents in need. So I have a partner at the church with whom I collaborate. And uh, the two of us work with social workers and we can give relatively small, uh, not huge amounts of money uh, to people who in Arbordale who are residents of Arbordale who are having hard times in their lives. And, you know, maybe they can't pay the rent this month or uh, maybe their car needs a repair and they don't have the money to repair it, but they need the car to go to work. Um, so at any rate, uh, my colleague and I uh, deal with those questions and are able to help people out a lot, many times. Uh, there was one question that I wanted to ask you that was related to zoning and housing. And even though it's kind of out of order, I'd like to return to it nonetheless. So please forgive me. Um, sure. The whole subject of uh, McMansions. And I know uh, we've heard a lot of concern about affordable housing uh, all over the city we see developers tearing down naturally affordable homes, what we used to call starter homes, access into the housing market. 
Um, is there a role for city government in regulating McMansionization? Uh, let's ask um, Doris Ann first. Um, you know, you're getting into a tricky area here of how much the government can get into uh, regulating what's, you know, kind of a, an industry. And uh, I'm not sure how much we can do. We do uh, certain things like require when there is a large building require a certain amount of affordable housing in that multifamily home. Uh, but if you're talking about an individual's right to do a McMansion, I'm not sure that the city actually has much leeway to regulate how big that can be. Um, in There are zoning regulations that will apply in certain cases, um, but, you know, it's tricky when you try to regulate the free market. Randy, do you agree with that? Well, I agree that the market is a powerful force and Newton is a desirable place to live. So the value of our land has gone up dramatically. And in a way, that's a good thing. That, that indicates the kind of city that we live in. But there are things that we can do to identify and preserve naturally affordable housing. We can't prohibit it. It's private property and people can still tear it down. But we can look at the side setbacks we can set side, back, side setback um, um, metrics that will make it a little less likely that this happen. And I wish that the city council would be focusing on this in it while it also looks at all these village center uh, rezoning proposals. Thank you. Uh, it is time for closing remarks. I'd like to hear from each of you why you think that you are the best person to represent Ward 4 on the City Council. And we will start with Randy. My name's Randy Block. I'm seeking to be your Ward 4 City Councilor. I've knocked on just about every door in this neighborhood. And the people who answer the doors have a lot of concerns. They're concerned about overdevelopment, they're concerned about the quality of schools. They're concerned about traffic. They're concerned about something like the Turtle Lane development that's been an eyesore for six or seven years now. This city can do better. The city must do better. And if elected as your city councilor, I will be a link between the constituents who have these concerns and the city departments that are here to respond to it. That's my goal as a potential city councilor, and I ask for your vote on November 7th. Dara Sam. So I know as a community, we share the same goals. We all want a city that offers excellent schools, interesting and varied restaurants and services, parks and trails, and a range of housing options for all of our residents. Um, as a community, we value human dignity, social justice, and progressive ideals. As your city councilor, I will work to make sure our policies reflect those values. I am proud that I've been endorsed by Representative Kay Khan, 13 of the current city councilors, as well as Progressive Newton, voters for a vibrant Newton, the Gun Violence Prevention Collaborative, and Engine 6. And just so you know, I stepped down from the leadership team of Engine 6 when I decided to run for office. And I believe I'll be an effective, collaborative member of the City Council. I hope I can count on your vote on November 7th. Thank you very much, Randy and Doris Ann. A quick but important note that was recently called to my attention, the printing of the November ballots is a little confusing. The ward counselor for each of the wards is at the end of the school committee race on the back of the ballot, but it's not separated from the school committee race. So 
look for your ward counselor in the least obvious position on the ballot. Thanks so much to the candidates for setting aside this time to reflect on the important issues facing the city. Thanks to your will, thanks for your willingness to put yourself out there. And thanks to the area councils who planned the logistics of this series of debates, then planned them again and yet again. And for those of you who just can't get enough of this, tomorrow we'll hear from candidates in three races, ward councilors from wards two and six, and counselor at large from Ward 6. Till then, have a good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much.